Hello. How you doing? So we have Dr. Tammy Baker Dan coming on. We're going to be showing off some SES, correct? Yes, some Medtronic SES today. Very nice. So we'll get through the slides, and uh, if you can come right over here in the presenter yep. position, and if you want to lead or if you want me to lead, there you go. Okay, so we are going to be talking about Medtronic spinal cord stimulation. We're going to do a little bit of an overview. So this first slide just talks about, you know, how do you present this to a patient? So when I am talking to my patients, I kind of tell them, hey, we all know that you have, you know, pacemakers for your heart that help your heart work correctly. Well, this is kind of like a pacemaker for your spine. It actually tries to make sure that the good signals get through and the bad signals don't get through. So that's pretty much the easiest way that I can have to kind of make it so it makes more sense to these patients. Another way of describing it is just to, you know, we're gonna disrupt that pain signal. We're gonna block the pain signal. So instead of letting that pain signal get back to your brain from your leg or your back, it's gonna go ahead and make it so it gets cut off at the pass, basically. So what indications do we use this for? You can see this is a very, very long list that we have here. So we have failed back, that's gonna be our most common thing. Any sort of radicular pains, post laminectomy, um, uh, complex regional pain syndrome, really any variety. I think that's a great point. That list, what, probably five years ago, was a lot shorter. And kudos to all the research that's been done that SES is now helping a lot wider range of patients. So, you know, for you out there that aren't doing SES yet or just doing SES still for post laminectomy syndrome, take a screenshot of this, uh, of this slide and really, you know, there's a lot of patients out there that you can help that uh, we haven't been able to help in the past. So how do you choose these candidates? So these are people that, you know, they've tried reasonable things. You've given them some injections, they're just not lasting. You've, you know, tried to do all the basic things. You've tried a couple different types of medications. You know, things are just not where the patient wants to be or where they're the most functional at. You know, you're not gonna do it on someone that's pregnant or has coagulopathy. So some of these are pretty much, you know, you're gonna understand that you're not going to provide this for that patient, but really you've got wide indications for this for your patient population. Now, the one thing that really sets apart some of what we're gonna talk about today is that Medtronic has specific indication that you can use it for diabetic peripheral neuropathy. So we've all known that spinal cord stimulation works for that, but the issue was we could never actually do it for that. You would say, well, I have this patient and they have failed back surgery syndrome, but they also have some peripheral neuropathy from their diabetes. And well, it just so happens that it works really well for that as well. So at this point, you don't need to have them have any other diagnosis codes with it. You can just go ahead and use it for your peripheral neuropathy people. Now, I'm gonna make a point on this that it does need to be lower limbs. So you're looking at feet for this. And you know, once again, these are patients. You've done the medications, you've used the gabapentin, you've already tried to do reasonable ways to control this. You do want to make sure though that these are also good surgical candidates. You don't want to do someone that, you know, their A1C is 14. You know, you need to look and see them, make sure that they actually are having, you know, pretty good control of their diabetes at this point. I think that's a great point. When I first heard about the diabetic peripheral neuropathy indication, my first thought was we're going to have a lot of infections. And from what I've done so far for uh, peripheral neuropathy and diabetic and you, have you seen any difference? I, I think the data shows the infection risk is about the same, correct? Um, yeah, about the same, and I will say that I do not have a hard cutoff line for my hemoglobin A1Cs on these patients. So classically, I'm, I'm looking at the whole patient. You know, what is their blood glucose levels on a consistent basis if, when they're taking them? You know, they'll come in, they'll show me their Dexcoms. That's the little thing they wear on their arm. They're showing me what their readouts are, and if the readouts all look pretty good, and you know, the rest of them looks good, their heart looks good, kidneys look good, everything else, you know, maybe their A1C is nine, but you know, we go ahead and, and do the implant. The other thing that's really nice is that there's something called a Tyrex pouch that's going to release you know, antibiotic into that space and then it slowly dissolves over time. I use that often with these patients as well because it does cut down you know, on your chances of infection. That's great. So just a little bit about the specific waveform that we're talking about. So this is the DTM. DTM stands for Differential Targeted Multiplex. So all it means is that you have multiple targets along that spinal cord stimulation lead and that it's gonna send out different signals. So it's a very complex signal that's going out. And that is what we're mainly gonna be talking about as far as you know DTM programming versus tonic programming or what type of programming we use for these. When it comes to diabetic peripheral neuropathy, I will say that 
I use DTM programming on that. I also use programming, the traditional tonic programming. So it really doesn't matter. If you look at the studies, really it works just fine for tonic programming. And then it also just has on here a little bit more about patient selection. You obviously want people that have chronic pain and that they have the diagnoses that are consistent. Awesome. So just a little bit about the different generators. So this little Intellis, this is the rechargeable one. And this one is kind of cool because it's almost like your little, you know, watch battery. So it actually will charge up to complete in about 45 minutes for most of my patients. Um, it usually says about an hour, but I would say they're coming in and saying about 45 minutes. They charge it anywhere from once a day. Some people really like to have a full battery. Some of us, we go to bed at night and our, our battery on our phone says that we have 84% left and we're still going to charge it all night long. So, you know, patients are like that with these not with these rechargeable systems too. And then it will charge pretty quick for them and they can keep doing that over and over again. It's not going to affect this battery. Um, as far as being able to monitor that, they have something called snapshot reporting and that snapshot reporting will also make it so that when you're looking to see how often are you recharging? Because I have some people say, I recharge all the time. And so I can kind of spy and say, well, you know, you were only down to 60%, so you don't really have to recharge. You can give it some time. So it's a very nice thing to have so that you can really zone in on, you know, what patients are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. And it is very, very tiny. So I usually tell people that this generator, let me show it here, here, that this generator is actually about the size of a couple, like, dollar coins all taped together. So it's really nice to have that tiny little battery, very easy to put in for people that are not used to doing implants as well. So we'll move on then to the recharge, the non-rechargeable. So Vanta is the non-rechargeable generator that's available. And just a note on both of these generators, they are full body MRI compatible. So it does not matter if they have impedances, it doesn't matter if the battery is dead, they can go get their MRI. Very, very nice. So I get essentially no phone calls on these two generators when it comes to MRIs because they have something in their little wallet that says, yes, we can go ahead and get this MRI done. Makes it so much easier for your clinic, so much less paperwork, phone calls, things like that. As far as this generator goes, that non-rechargeable generator, it will give you a readout that says, hey, this generator has, you know, seven years left on it. If you reprogram it and all of a sudden you're bringing it down to three years, it's going to tell you right at the time of reprogramming. So that's a very nice feature of it as well. And it does last quite a while on just our traditional programming that we have available. But like I said, you can always keep track of it because the patients aren't going to stay on the same programming. After about the first two years or so, I think most people decide, oh, I want to change up my programming. So you really want to see what effect that's going to have on them. Great. And that's it for the slides. Awesome. So let's get to doing the procedure. We're going to do one side, right? Yes. And we're going to show off how we would do a permanent implant, correct? Yes. So we are going to focus on permanent implant only so that I can show everybody what the anchors look like, because that's really one of the things that's the biggest difference between companies. Now, when it comes to needles, you know, we always have the option between a straight needle and a curved needle. I'm a curved needle person. You just have, have you know, yeah. what you like. I was a straight needle person for the longest time and then randomly transitioned. So, you know, it just kind of depends. So I will usually take my needle and use it as my marker. And I usually will go ahead and get a picture, please. And mark my space that's about one vertebral level below where I want to go. So I am looking at going at the T12L1 space here, which is right up here. So I'm going to drop down here to L2 and picture. And this is about the area where I would normally make my incision point. So I will take a marker classically, mark that. For the sake of time today, we're just going to do our cut down at this area. I think it's a great point. I think a lot of people sometimes make their incision all the way up by where they're going to enter. And if you think about it, you're since you're doing your cut down, you're going to have the needle traverse granularly. And this will save the patient a few extra stitches um, in the long run. And there is debate, you know, do you cut down first or do you go ahead and place your needle first? It's really whatever you're comfortable with. So if you're not comfortable with placing that needle first, then you really shouldn't, shouldn't do that. So 
I always tell everybody, do what makes you comfortable. I was taught to go ahead and do the cut down first, and I got burned that first time. <laughs> <laughs> you um, do. You make a little bigger incision. You have to make the incision a little. It's okay. I you know, make sure you're room. safe. Make sure you have room. We've all done that. We've all made a little bigger incision than we need. So the incision, you know, I wanted it to be this big. It wound up being like this yes. big. So it's okay. Though. It happens. Okay, go ahead and I'll take a picture there. And while she's working away in the epidural space, one thing I like to say about the spinal cord simulator perms is, you know, a lot of pain docs out there are doing the trials, but I think a lot of them are sending their perms off to a surgeon. And the surgery perm isn't benign. They're doing a laminectomy um, with the paddle lead. So, you know, I think it behooves you to try um, to get comfortable with doing the permanents. I agree completely. I have people send me specifically patients that they have trialed for me to put in the implant and yeah. it's from another pain doctor so yeah, i think it, it, it's in our wheelhouse we should be doing this it's not that invasive the hardest part to me is the anchoring um she's so going to show you how that's easy but it, it really you know we're not getting that invasive it's not much more invasive than the trial once you learn how to make the pocket it's, it's not that difficult and what i've done here while we've been chatting is i went ahead and came down and i went straight to lamina right on that T12 vertebral body, or a one vertebral body. I went straight down to the lamina. Once I got to lamina, I have a hard resistance here. I cannot advance further. This is the point when I usually put my loss of resistance syringe on, and then I will gently walk off that lamina. And picture. I like how she said that. It's a very safe way to do it. You know you have a backstop. I like that a lot. And then what I do is I'm a constant pressure person. I put in lots and lots of epidurals and pregnant ladies trying to jump across the table away from me. And I've always <laughs> been the constant pressure person. So that is usually how I do it. And I will go ahead and keep advancing this until I get that loss and picture. Kind of see here. That was a really good loss, actually, for a cadaver. <laughs> One thing I like to point out, too, is that angle that she has with that needle. Some people, when we're doing epidurals, we come straight down in that space, correct? And when you're sliding the lead in, you really want to slide in the epidural space. You don't want to bounce off the dura. And the way to do that is have that nice angle trajectory. And that's very much in your starting point. And I'll also make the point here that when we're doing this, you know, it's going to depend if you're a person that comes in on one needle on each side. If you come in and you're doing both on the same side, which is what I normally would do, I will take this needle and I will hug that spinous process a little bit more so that I have space to put in that second lead in so, that area. So you usually like putting both needles on the same side? Yes. I try to, I like that as well. Then it's only one incision yeah. to worry about. Okay, and then usually what I will do is I will go ahead and get this right to the edge. I'll take a picture. And maybe I went a little That's bit further beautiful. than the edge. <laughs> you have such a great trajectory right up the start there. As I say, you really want to aim for that midline area. So the closer you are to midline, the easier it is to thread this. And part of that is because you're avoiding the conus. So conus can be your worst enemy if you start sliding off the edge of that. And the beauty of having this curved needle is, let's say that I was having issues where I was running into conus and the patient, you know, was jumping every time, then I can easily take that needle and twist it just a little bit to redirect. And then that will actually give me an additional way to guide that. Yeah, yeah I think steering is, is really uh, imperative. And you have two different options there. Can we take a picture? Ooh, I wanted to see what I was saying. Mm -hmm, that's good. <laughs> And then let's go ahead and go live for a second so I can kind of show them how we can get this. So you can see, you can Very really nice. get this. And I am twisting this from back with my rear hand. So the front hand is only feeding. That's all it's doing. So target. Let's talk target. And I have a few questions for you. Have you changed your target at all with different ailments that the patient has? Radiculopathy, post laminectomy, diabetic peripheral neuropathy. So classically, if it's someone with an axial low back pain, I will try to be up further into T7, maybe lower T7, upper T8. If it's true radiculopathy, you know, top of T8 is plenty high, I feel, for that. When it comes to doing like the diabetic peripheral neuropathy patients, I found all variety of placements work on those patients. So, you know, you can start out at the L1, L2 space and enter. Now remember, you've got conus there too. Mm -hmm. But I find that, you know, maybe like starting out lower at like T9-ish when we start to... Is that what you guys have seen too? I see that a lot in the field, yes. For the peripheral neuropathy being a little lower? 
a little low, yeah, all different variety of it, but yes, yeah, a little lower typically for us too. Great. Okay, so we were at 12 and 10, and then go ahead and go wide here. And I am just twisting this little lead at the back and go ahead and go wide. Yeah, just hitting a little adhesion. So Great. if you hit an adhesion, yeah. <laughs> that is going to be the other thing. So a lot of times you will see that lead and we're good. Um, kind of bend on you and do this little thing where it almost like starts to S curve on its own in there. So when I find that I've hit an adhesion, if I can't just steer around it, so a lot of times I'll just go ahead and go ahead and go live here for me so I can show on. So you can see I can take this lead and I can just make little twists to it and I can make it go back and forth if I want to. So if I can't get around it, we're good. If I can't get around it doing that, I have a little trick that I do and it doesn't necessarily work with every company's leads, but it works pretty good for this one. I will undo this back portion of the stylet. You can see it right, I think we can see it on one of these cameras. And I'll make it, as I say, you can see it on this camera over here. Yeah, yeah okay. right there. there. So I just undid the end of the stylet and I pulled it back a little bit. And all it does is it makes that stylet a little bit more flimsy at the front and it can kind of weave its way in there a little bit better. So that's just one of the tricks that I learned from one of my mentors way, way back in the day. So that's another way that you can get around that as well. Great. I don't know if you had any other tips or tricks there. I like that. You guys, you guys have a harder stylet as well that we can place if we need to. So these are the only stylets that come. If you're lower down, we do have the one piece of straight wire that you can yeah. use to. Get I like to get around them though, because I feel like sometimes you hit the adhesion, especially in the trials of the patient awake, you'll, they'll jump a little bit because the mm -hmm. adhesion yeah. is, is usually around the, the spinal cord, the spinal canal. They do not so, like it no. at all. Mm -hmm. So I don't like to just plow right through them usually. Right. I try to get <coughs> and then usually what I'll do, let's say that we've got our, our lead into placement there. I do test mine every single time. I want to make sure that there's no surprises post-op because, you know, let's say it looks great. It looks exactly like it did when you did their their trial lead, everything looks fine. But if you don't test it and then you come out of the OR and they say, I'm only getting one side and it's not the side that I had the pain on, mm -hmm. what do you do then? I mean, you're already sewed up, it's not a good spot to be. Yeah, so I mean, take the extra time, do the extra tests, communicate really well with your anesthesia um, and let them know, like, hey, I'm almost to the point where I'm going to test. I find that just communicating with them really well makes it so there's not a long wake up time. I also tell them I'm going to put in boatloads of numbing medication here, so really nothing should be extra stimulating. I'm going to numb them down, and I say I did this in my office under local only, yeah. and they were fine. So really, it's the cut down that's the part that's going to be the most irritating for them. And you usually use Mac. I usually use Mac. Conscious sedation. Yes, yes conscious sedation. Okay. Um, I will use this little wheat lantern here, and I don't know if everybody is familiar with this device. I'll put it here. But I will usually use that to open up this incision spot a little bit wider for us. And then that at that point, I will come down around the needle with some suture and I'll put some suture around it. They have these fun little anchors that are my favorite. I can get it in there. So this is called the Inject Anchor. And this anchor, oh, yeah. this little anchor, it has something that you can just pull on and it will actually hug onto that specific lead. So if I were going to put this in permanently, and let's say I had my two sutures in there already, and those were in place, then I would go ahead, classically, I pull my needle back under live fluoro because I don't want any surprises after the fact. So let's go live so we can see how much I move this. And I put a little frontwards pressure on, nothing super exciting there. That's good. So I didn't move that lead at all. And I will say when I'm placing leads, depending on the size of the patient, and I call it the fluffiness factor, depending on how big they are is how much higher I'm gonna go than my target. So if my target is top of T8, and it is something that I deem to be on the end of the fluffiness factor that I think that lead has more potential for migration, I will place it about two to three contacts higher because I know once they get up and start moving around, it's gonna come down. It's now, I was gonna say, like if they that. have less fluffiness, then that person is someone that I'm gonna say, hey, you know, I don't probably need to to put this up quite as high. Maybe I'll give them like half of a contact difference. That's good. 
So I will usually pull this down and I have a debakey most of the time, but we're gonna use this. And this is what I will go ahead and feed because I don't want anything to happen to this. And then you can actually poke it down right along the same path that you had your needle at. And then I will hold on to it usually, and then I just pull back, and that anchor is on there. So easy, very, very easy. So I'm gonna pull it out just a little bit so you can see how it comes on here. I think we can see it on camera four there, yeah. And there. so it is down on top of this. There we go. And then you wind up putting your sutures around these little bumps. So there are bumps along here. All you have to do is line up your suture with the bump. I use zero Ethibon sutures to do this, and classically I'll do two of them. Once I have those two sutures in, I do something called the tug test that gives all of my new reps a heart attack, um, <laughs> where I go under my fluoro and I say, we're doing the tug test now, this thing can't move. Be ready. We're not coming back and I will yank on it and see if it moves at all. And I will say it, there's very little motion, if any motion, when I do this with just two at the bonds. If there's even a little bit of motion, most of the time I, I will just say, I'm gonna put in one more at the bond. I can never have enough at the bonds, is what I tell them. I hand tie those. Um, you know, it really does not take me that long to do it. So yeah. I don't see. And you put the the suture around the needle first, to, for, yes. correct? So I think that's a great pearl too. Because some people are always worried about suturing through the wire. Mm -hmm. If you put the suture around the needle first before you pull that needle out, they're sitting there waiting for you to tie around, correct? Yes. And usually what I do is I have my scrub, first assist, whoever's with me, they hold it down flat okay. for me. And then as long as they can hold it down flat, then I can suture around it. Now the one thing you do have to look out for is that you don't suture the debakies or the pickups or whatever they're holding it down with. Because if you were to suture that, then you have to start over. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So that's how we get the anchor in. Um, last two minutes here. So tunneling, getting to the pocket, building the pocket. Um, where do you usually put your pocket? Any tips and tricks for tunneling? So classically, I like to put the pockets kind of in that like upper area. Most people have like a little bit of, of extra tissue that falls down right below their ribs, but above their iliac crest. Yeah. So pretty much everybody has a little bit there to work with. Now, I will have them mark it ahead of time. I have them pick what side they want because the last thing I want is to have this fabulously functioning spinal cord stimulator that all they do is complain about the back of the pocket. So every patient gets to pick. So sometimes it's a left, sometimes it's a right. Other things I ask them, do you have shoulder problems? So my husband's a shoulder surgeon and I became very cognizant of this, that some people can't reach to the back in order to be able to recharge their device. Yeah. So if they have a bad shoulder, you don't want to put it on that side. So that's one question I usually ask a lot of my older patients. Um, so they really get to pick it. When it comes to tunneling, depending on how far away you are, you can use the actual tunneler that comes with this, which is this little device. I always bend it up just a little mm -hmm. bit. So that way I'm trying to stay up towards the skin. I don't want to go deeper at all. Um, if you've got less room to go, I mean, it's completely fine to just use your needle that you used to place your leads. So you just have to go in from the pocket that you formed and go towards the middle of the incision site. And then that way you can pull it back. Awesome, I think this is great. Main takeaway for the people not doing permanent yet, it's very much in our wheelhouse. Um, I hope this gets you going in that direction. Matronic, thank you very much. I love thank the you. indications we have now. That was beautiful. Way to start it off. Thank you so Amazing. much for having us. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Awesome.